This program is brought to you by Emory University.
Gary for that really lovely and generous introduction and um, referencing many of the really strong um, features and instincts and threads in this Emory community and how it connects to the larger Atlanta community. And I feel like I've known you, and I saw several other people come in here and say the same thing. I feel like I've known you for a long time, even though we just actually officially met about a month ago, thanks to Jane Thorpe. So thank you, Jane, also for your role in all of this. And, um, and in that regard, I think there's something about, I know there's something about your fiction, your literature, your poetry, that feels like it's, it's my voice. It feels mm -hmm. like it's our voice. And so I'm curious about your voice, how you feel your voice um, started as an artist or a writer and how it's continued to blossom over time or change even, especially considering the various genres in which you mm -hmm. work in. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I uh, am very fortunate. I, I grew up in a, a household where my father um, was an, a wonderful, wonderful speaker. So I grew up watching someone who knew how to use language. Um, and I remember as a, as a little kid watching my father on Saturday night. My father was good for waiting until the last minute to write his sermons so that it would be late Saturday night and there would be just every kind of material on the table where he was working. Um, books, papers, old notes of his, everything. Um, and I would watch him digest all of this and think about all the things he had been talking about um, over the last week or so. My father was good for talking to me like I was able to understand things way before I was able to understand them. <laughs> um, but I would watch him take all of this information and put it together in a way that became a sermon that was completely accessible to anyone who came into our church. My father was not a person who was interested in exploring ideas at a level that was not accessible to ordinary people. So that I was always in awe of the fact that I would have been spending the week listening to him talking about Franz Fanon, talking about whatever the, the thing was he was reading. And then what I would hear him talk it was very personal. It was like he was just talking to each of us. So that I admired that, and I think that that made a big impression on me in terms of wanting to be able to write in a style that invites people in. Um, I admire people who um, write in all different kinds of styles. I mean, I love Toni Morrison, but I never feel like I can read Toni Morrison without having to get ready to read Toni Morrison because the, the dictionary has to be there because you have to turn off the music, you have to make sure that you know no grandchildren are around because you've got to focus on that. And I think she really wants that. She wants you to have to do that work at the, at the front. I'm more a writer who wants you to be able to sneak in thinking that it's all going to be a breeze. Mm -hmm. And then later you realize that I'm talking about something that's very serious to you or something that is um, really important and we need to focus on it. But I take a, um, the opposite approach from, from someone um, who sets it up at the beginning so you know you got to work hard. I want you to think it's just going to be a pleasant Saturday night. Uh -huh. And then it turns out to be, oh my God, we're talking about the revolution. We're talking about you know <laughs> men and women. We're talking about whatever it is. But it's, I think I'd I initially got that from my from my father. Right. It sounds like he may have used that same technique then in a sermon, so bringing mm -hmm. people in and then going to Absolutely. some larger, bigger moment or um, historical event. And speaking of history, it's such a, it seems like such a really important part of your work. It seems really embedded in a lot of historical details, especially of the late. 20th century of you know the past century of the civil rights movement and also th this event itself the um, the festival is has this historical impulse in which um, in the early years and and even until today really relies on the work of poets like James Weldon Johnson and Langston Hughes and others and I wondered if they had been influential voices in your work. Very, very, especially Langston Hughes, who is probably my favorite writer in the world. Um, if I had to pick one book to take to the desert island, it would be <laughs> The Big Sea, the first volume of right. his autobiography, um, which my mother actually used to read to us like mothers read fairy tales to their children. My mother would read us Langston Hughes, um, which of course made a big impression on me um, as a person who knew, even as a very young child, that I wanted to write. But I think that the historical movements that have been a part of my generation Mm -hmm. um, and I came of age in the 60s, so I am an unashamed 60s child. But the, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the anti-war movement, um, all of those were movements that were very important to me as a, as a young woman 
um, growing up and as a person in a part of a very activist family so that I grew up within the civil rights movement within the racial struggle mm -hmm. that was going on. Then when I got a little older, I added the women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, the war in Vietnam was going on so that the anti-war movement was very present there. So that I can see in my work my own struggling with those questions, with how do we deal with those questions. And I kind of felt like I had gotten all the big questions, um, not out of the way, but that I understood what I was doing with the big questions. And then Barack Obama got elected president. And I realized that the next big phase of my work is really about redefining my relationship to the country I was born in. Um, my husband teases me about being a new American um, because I was raised on the west side of Detroit in a black nationalist, predominantly separatist environment. So that the whole idea of relating to the United States as my country was completely foreign to me. We sang the black national anthem, which they're going to sing as part of this festival tomorrow. Um, we had our own flag. We had our own schools. We had our own everything. So that we were very much in an adversarial position um, when it came to our citizenship in the United States. Then as the Democratic primaries went on and I watched my candidate, and I had always been a big supporter of Barack Obama, but I watched him begin to win in places like South Dakota and um, places where I had the thought that I know many of my African-American friends had, which is how many black people live in South Dakota. <laughs> he can't possibly carry North Dakota, South Dakota, all of these places. And it dawned on me that it wasn't that only black people were voting for this African-American candidate, that other American people were voting for the best candidate, and race was no longer the absolute determining factor, which was such a wonderful thing for me um, that it allowed me a much bigger space to move around mm -hmm. in my own country and to think about what that means, to not um, have that Pollyanna attitude, now everything is perfect, the president is great. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the news for two seconds, you know that is not true, that everything is not perfect. But for me, it gives me a different way to be involved in trying to make it perfect. I now feel like I am an American citizen mm -hmm. improving my own country, rather than I am an angry outsider telling my country what they need to do um, with the complete rock and the finger and everything, <laughs> all of that. So now I feel like, OK, I have to find a better way to be a conscious American citizen mm -hmm. in everything that I do. Um, when I uh, took this position at the Alliance Theater, I was very conflicted about it because the Alliance is a great big regional theater in a great big art center. And it still has a lot of historical baggage that it has to carry about being a big white institution for very wealthy white people. Now, as a little black nationalist girl from Detroit, I was not real comfortable becoming a part of that <laughs> world. And my husband said to me, you're looking at this all wrong. Think of yourself as an American artist who's going to work at an American theater, which is very different than saying, I'm an angry black artist going to beat down the walls of the, of the big white theater. So I actually started saying that to myself. I'm an American theater artist. I'm going to work in an American theater. And that's exactly what it is. But it's a, um, a chance for me, I think, as a writer to really take seriously the opportunity to redefine how I use language, how I uh, describe situations, how I think of myself moving through mm -hmm. situations, which is very exciting to me. I mean, I thought I had exhausted all the movements I could think of, right. and now this one I'm sure will take me to 120 when I probably will have something else to think of. Thanks to Barack Obama. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And who knows what will come next? You know, I mean, the, the whole idea that 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 allowed me a space in. We're going to have a woman president before it's all over. Yeah. I hope it will be a progressive, wonderful woman president, because I know that gender is not always the deciding thing. <laughs> um, but I know that all of the changes that the country is making make it um, a different place mm -hmm. than it was when I was 12 years old, 13 years old. And I'm excited about so that, that changes some of, perhaps some of the tone or the perspective in your writing. And also, you have a novel that takes place in kind of the immediate aftermath of the Obama um, inauguration with um, a young woman who wants a job working for Barack Obama and, um, and then ends up in Atlanta um, and kind of running interference with her father, mm -hmm. right? And so that, uh, that's a novel that brings into kind of current events. It sounds like um, some people um, are kind of reincarnated in a way in this work, people from, from your life, and also the Atlanta itself, where, mm -hmm. where the city, and, and, and which has been a co very common feature in, in your fiction in particular. I really wanted to, to talk about some of the older civil rights um, 
activists mm -hmm. that I knew. Um, because when I got here, I met a lot of these people and most of them knew my dad, so that they instantly welcomed me into the group. Um, so that I was able to work with them, to know them, to uh, meet them in circumstances where I didn't just have to say, oh my goodness, that's Andrew Young, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, that's C.T. Vivian. They became people um, that I knew. And I know that this transition um, from the America that we knew and protested against and fought against, and now the America that we're still involved in trying to make perfect, but a very different country, that a lot of those transitions were very challenging for many of those, um, for many sure. of those activists. And I wanted to write about them. I wanted to actually give them um, not necessarily a love letter, but kind of, you know, because sometimes I feel like they don't think that we know what they did. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to know, not only do we know what they did, but we love them for doing right. it. We appreciate what they did and we see them because they're still around. You know, I live in Southwest Atlanta so that if I go in the, the mail center in, in Southwest Atlanta, sometimes I will run into C.T. Vivian. I can be in the Publix and run into Andrew Young. And I realize that a lot of the people in those environments don't know who these guys are, who these gentlemen are. And I have, you know, made a fool of myself trying to explain to people, you know, don't you know who that was? Well, let me tell you who mm -hmm. this is. So 10 minutes later, the poor person who just came to get some dinner <laughs> has got to <laughs> listen and hear about CT and how he faced down Jim Clark and how he never was afraid and all of that. And I think, you know, they understand that it's something significant mm -hmm. because why else am I preaching to them in the, in the produce department? But I think <laughs> part of what that book was about was trying to really integrate those guys into the current struggle and show that they not only have lots of experience that we need, but they're still alive and well and brilliant and fearless and are still very much involved in all of this. So that book really was was trying to show them as part of all of this. And that. imperfect themselves. Imperfect, exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. so that, that they don't have a, a special saintly glow about them, but a right. real um, tangible feeling of living in the world right. with all of its complexities. And the name of that novel is actually taken from a work by Duke Ellington, is mm -hmm. that right? Till You Hear From Me. Yes. I love that song because it's do nothing till you hear from me, uh, pay don't, no attention to what's said, and it's a man talking to a woman. And she obviously has heard something about him, and he's obviously wrong. He has done whatever this is that she heard. But he's saying do not believe it, don't believe anything until you hear it from me, mm -hmm. which is such a, you know, it's like you want to say, no, I'm not going for that. <laughs> but it's such a great song. So that it's like, I always love that song because of the, you know, all of the, um, the kind of pleading. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it kind of struck me differently because I had only heard men sing that song. And I heard Gladys Knight sing oh. it. And she sang it wonderfully. Mm -hmm. And it kind of gave me that moment that you have where you say, you know, when I hear this song, I'm always thinking, that man is lying to that woman. <laughs> and then when I heard Gladys sing it, I said, this woman is so lying to this man. <laughs> so that it's like, once you can, that I think is the big challenge, is mm -hmm. to get to where we all do everything as humans. We do all the good stuff, we do all the bad mm -hmm. stuff. And it's not just that white folks do this and black folks do this. It's not that women do this and men do this. We all do the full range of human behavior. And I think for me as a writer, getting rid of all of those we do this and they do this, all of those mm -hmm. they and we questions. If I can get rid of those, I think it gets me closer to what mm -hmm. I'm actually always trying to do, which is to find the part where we're all human beings, mm -hmm. where we all do the same silly things. We all tell the same three lies. We all have the same four things we want to do. Mm -hmm. And to be able to get past all those things that make us think our little segment of the race is different, our little segment of the world population is different, and realize we're all we're all doing it. You know, as writers, we're all writing about family. We're all writing about war. We're all writing about love affairs. We're all writing about getting old. We're writing about the same things, but it's just the specificity of the cultural context um, that we're using to put it forward. Do you, do you think then that art inspires empathy? Oh, I do. I do. I really, really do. <laughs> I do. I think that, it's, that that's what's so wonderful, is that when you are arguing with someone, talking passionately with someone about um, major issues of the day, it's very difficult to get the person to really open up to what you're saying. And I think that's one of the, the horrible things that's happening in our country right now is that the dialogue is so intractable, mm -hmm. you know, that there's people who take a position they will not go beyond it. And I think that part of what culture is able to do is to make those same points that a politician might want to make, but do it in a way where you don't realize that that's what you're learning. Mm 
because you think you're looking at a play about a family and you're following that family. Right. And you don't realize that this family is also your family. Mm -hmm. So that you begin to understand that whole thing about all families are the same, that all humans are the same, because you're able to look at it emotionally mm -hmm. and your intellect is switched off for a minute. And I think that that's part of what art is able to do, what culture is able to do, and certainly what music mm -hmm. is able to do. Um, I'm very honored to be a part of this festival because I don't have music. I write about music, and I love music, but um, I can't sing, I cannot um, play anything, but I understand that music is able to transcend so many things right. because you can't argue it. You know, if you hear a beautiful piece of music, you're going to feel it, and yeah. you don't have to go through the intellectual argument about, should I like this? Who wrote this? Was it a politically correct African-American woman? <laughs> if it wasn't, I'm not listening to it. You know, was it someone who grew up exactly like I did? If it's not, I'm not <laughs> listening to it. Because you can't, you can't argue music that way. You can't argue poetry that mm -hmm. way. Um, because it's going at you, it's coming at you in another, through another path. It's not trying to get you to intellectually agree to the facts of the matter. Mm -hmm. It's trying to get you to feel something. And I think that's what, that's what we can do as artists that politicians can mm -hmm. never do. It's about emotion. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of both music and poetry, um, you've had some of your own work um, put to music. Mm -hmm. Um, so you want to talk about a little bit about that experience, what that was um, like, and it how was that happened? wonderful. Um, the composer, uh, T.J. Anderson, was in residence at Morehouse um, College, and he's speaking, I don't think in this room, but here on this campus tomorrow at, at 4, um, and had read uh, my first book of poetry was, was called We Don't Need No Music, which is, I'm sure a musician <laughs> had to pick that up and say, what do you mean we don't need music? <laughs> but of course, this was a chant that we used to have it, uh, when I was in college, and those of you who may have been to black colleges know this was just something that we used to chant, and what it really meant was, we really do need music, we love music, we're all having a good time, it's a party kind of thing. So that when I, um, I wrote the book, and he had picked up a copy while he was here and really enjoyed the poems. And when I met him, he asked me if I was interested in allowing him to explore setting some of these poems to music. And I, of course, was very interested right. in that. I had never had any kind of exchange like that with musicians. What I had done was where the musician will play, and then you read something, then the musician mm -hmm. plays, and then you read something, which is always fun, fun and wonderful, but not the same. But he actually wrote music um, for these poems. Um, and they were all poems about um, kids in a neighborhood, and so it was called block songs because they were um, poems about what was going on in my neighborhood, in my block at the time. And it was, it was just amazing. I mean, his work is so wonderful, and the fact that he um, saw something in my poetry mm -hmm. that, that then made him want to write music was just a wonderful gift to me. So did that bring out parts of the poetry that you hadn't really felt or realized or experienced? Did you see different aspects, well, dimensions of it? It wasn't so much that I saw it different, but I saw it communicated mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that it was, it was less that he saw things I didn't see and more that he saw what I saw and could speak about it in the language that he knew. Mm -hmm. So that it was wonderful mm -hmm. because you could see that without the words, I'm so tied to words, mm -hmm. without the words, it still felt like a little girl playing on the sidewalk mm -hmm. without any words at all. Wow. So that that's always wonderful mm -hmm. because you'd realize that you don't have to speak the same mm -hmm. language, that these feelings, these emotions right. can be expressed in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. So when you move from genre to genre, my, as I sort of scanned what looked like your uh, published work, it looked like your um, playwriting was really dominant in the 90s, and several of your works were premiered at the Alliance mm -hmm. Theater, and that's how I first became familiar with your work. And then you also um, had a novel that was an Oprah pick as well, and that was, I guess, towards the late 90s, and, and then, uh, and throughout all that time, I think you've been writing poetry, is that right? So, so are you working on these um, different genres and kind of interlocking ways at similar moments, or do you, are, are you in a different, kind of in a different place in life, or in a different um, emotional context when you're employing one genre as opposed to another? Um. I don't know if it's ever that organized. Uh -huh. um, I wish that it was that organized. <laughs> but um, I, I used to write a lot more poetry. 
Um, and I still write poetry, but mostly for myself. I, mm -hmm. I haven't been publishing poetry. Um, and I'm, I'm trained in theater. I started mm -hmm. off writing plays. I always loved plays. I was that obnoxious little kid that would write the play for after Thanksgiving dinner where all the cousins have to go and do the play. And you have to watch the, you know, the pioneers and the Native <laughs> Americans and all of that. I was that child. Um, so that I grew up really loving theater. And even as a child, I wouldn't have called it collaborative process. But at the time, what I really liked about um, theater was that you write the play, but then you're in there with all your mm -hmm. cousins, all your friends, and it's messy and collaborative, and there's lots of people. And it might um, turn out somewhat differently than you yeah, initially expected. Yeah, because everybody expected. brings right. what they bring. Mm -hmm. The actors bring the, all of that. But then um, I had an idea. Mm -hmm. I had been writing plays, and I had an idea um, that was too big uh, for the stage, that I it would have been too long and it would have been too many mm -hmm. characters and all of that, so that I decided to try to write it as a novel. Um, I had never written a novel and I was extremely intimidated by the form. Right. Um, novelists have a big psych on all the rest of us, that they are the serious writers and the rest of us are dabbling kind of <laughs> right. in something else. And I always thought it was just the arrogance of novelists. Then when I tried to write one, I said, oh, I understand <laughs> why this is a different process because there's nothing collaborative about mm -hmm. a novel. It's all you, right. everything. Working in theater, I'm used to saying, it's a wonderful afternoon, it's a summer afternoon in Harlem, uh, the sun is shining, it's a, it's a beautiful day. Then the lighting designer, the set designer, they have to make it a beautiful day in Harlem. As a novelist, I have to describe mm -hmm. that beautiful day, so which was a very different, very different process. Um, good if you're a person who likes control, mm -hmm. if you want control of everything. Because in a novel, once it's on the page, that's what you get every time. In a play, um, you write it and it's different, not only with a different cast, it's different every night because the audience is different, the actors feel differently, everything changes because of the human factor. Okay. In a novel it does not. But I, I enjoyed the control um, part of it once I got over kind of shuddering about, you know, Toni Morrison on one shoulder and Alice Walker on the other, very intimidating <laughs> crowd I was looking at. Um, but finally got rid of, of all of that and, and started writing as more as a playwright, mm -hmm. I had been trying to write in third person because I thought that if you were going to be a serious novelist, you had to write in third person. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. I really did not enjoy it at all. And I'm very disciplined about when I would write. And it was right in the middle of my regular writing time, about 11 o'clock in the morning. And I found myself vacuuming the living room. <laughs> now, I don't care a thing about housework. I do not care about all of that. So the fact that I was vacuuming at 11 o'clock in the morning when I should have been writing not a good sign. was a bad sign, <laughs> a bad sign for me. So I had to get rid of all those pages trying to be Alice and Tony and say, OK, there be an Alice and Tony. Why don't you see if you can write the way you write? And I started writing it as one character talking which ended up being kind of a long monologue, which for me as a playwright, I can do that. I know mm -hmm. how to make people talk. So that my first novels were all first person right. because I could then put myself in the mouth of that woman mm -hmm. and let her talk. Uh, so I, I enjoyed it, but theater remains the, um, the form that I mm -hmm. enjoy the most because of the collaborative process. Writing is, I love the process and I love the work that you do by yourself, but it's very solitary right. and after a while it gets lonesome mm -hmm. because it's just you. You know, eventually you have to stop telling how wonderful it's going to be to all your friends who are sitting in your kitchen drinking wine. You have to stop and actually <laughs> put the words on paper, which is much harder than telling your friends how fabulous the book is going to be. Um, but if it's a play, when you get those words on paper and you get it done, then someone produces it, then it becomes mm -hmm. um, a tribe, it becomes a meeting of people mm -hmm. who are going to do this thing together. And I enjoy that part and it doesn't exist um, in fiction. So that drama part of your life that you um, started after Thanksgiving dinners um, as a child is really, it sounds like, it continues to be sort of the lifeblood for your work. Mm -hmm. And we, you mentioned um, poetry in passing and um, you write poetry now largely for yourself. Um, but it does seem that that poetic voice is an important part of both your novels and your plays. And do you, and, and perhaps even in writing this monologue, that kind of that poetic voice was coming through or coming to the surface. And so do you, do you feel those rhythms as well? And, oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. And um, because you want it to sound 
you want it to sound good. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I, I read everything out loud because I know that sooner or later it's going to have to be said mm -hmm. out loud. Um, I tend to write very long sentences. In a novel, that's not a problem. You can write a sentence that goes on for a chapter if you can figure out how to punctuate it, right. and it's fine. Right. That's right. Or you or can not. leave the punctuation out, <laughs> and you're good. Then you're avant-garde. It's fine. <laughs> Um, but you can't do that in a play right. because the actor has to breathe. So if you write a, 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 a speech that's a page long and you see the poor actor trying to take in air, take in air, take, but there's no place for them, then it's, then it's a problem. So that I always read my work out loud to make sure that there's a space um, for the actors um, to breathe. But I think that the, the idea of the rhythm of the language, um, which you would always, of course, think about in a poem, but the rhythm of it is still very important mm -hmm. um, to me. And I think that probably is, takes me back to my dad, too, who is the, you know, the big kind of overarching influence on my, on my writing um, because of the rhythm of the, of the church because of the call and response of the church, because he was a person who would build a sermon to the point where you had to say amen back to him. You know, you had to say teach. You had to say tell it rev. You had to say all that stuff that you all know that you want people to say in your congregation. You had to do it because that was your part. And it's almost like he sang the solo for the first you know, my father tended to preach long. When I go to churches and they're out in 15 minutes, I'm like, my dad wasn't warmed up until an hour and a half. He was talking so that he got to talk by himself for an hour. Then for the last 15, 20 minutes, we would get to, you know, to kind of respond. But I, I know that all of that um, willingness to open up the, um, that moment, that talking, that conversation to other people who have come um, is important to me. And I also think that the whole idea of theater is so tied to the idea of church. Right. The whole thing of coming into some place together. Um, and in theater, it's, it's even more an ancient ritual because we turn out the lights. So you're sitting there in the dark with other people in your, in your little row, in your little seat, and you're looking toward the light at people who are gonna tell you something that you're assuming is true, emotionally true. And I think that's such an ancient Thing, so that when people say to me, aren't you worried, you know, with all of these little screens and things that we can do in our hands, that people won't do theater anymore. And I always say, I cannot imagine mm -hmm. that because it's lovely to be able to see whatever you see on this little screen in your hand, but it's not the same as sitting next to other people who are breathing, looking at other people who are also breathing. So that it's all a, um, it's a much more intimate, much more ancient mm -hmm. exchange that I think is, is part of what poetry comes from. I think it's part of what music comes from, where we want to be together. One of the things that, that governments who are really trying to control people often will do is to outlaw music. And people won't let that happen. Mm -hmm. People sneak and play music. People risk their lives to play music. And I think the same is true of, of poetry. The same is true of literature. Right. If you say to people, you can't read poetry. You cannot have beauty. They're going to say, no, we're going to do mm -hmm. it. You have to kill us then because right. we have to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's true for an artist that we have to do it. And I think it's true for the people who seek out cultural experiences that they have to do it. So it sounds like you're suggesting that this artistic and cultural um, kind of drive for um, art is a part of us, um, a part of our, us as individuals and a part of our cultures. And one of the purposes of these creativity conversations is really to try to explore those creative processes and roots. And you've already mentioned that you have a ritual yourself around writing where you write at a particular time every day and I wonder if there are other constructs that help you kind of nurture that creative energy and your own creative spirit. Um, music, I play music mm -hmm. a lot when I'm writing um, depending on what it is I'm writing but I tend to play uh, music that I'm familiar with. I don't like new music because then my mind goes to, wow, how did he do that? What is she singing about? So I have to play you know, Bob Marley that I could sing in my sleep. I have to play um, Motown that I could sing in my sleep. I have to play things that feed whatever it is I'm writing about mm -hmm. but don't require my brain to engage right. um, completely, which um, I don't know how musicians would feel about being, you know, used in that way, but it's, a, um, it's an important part of, of just the, the environment that I'm trying to create. I grew up in Detroit, um, and Dwight and I laugh about this a lot, Dwight Andrews and I laugh about this, because music is such a big part of, was then, such a big part of life mm -hmm. in Detroit. I went to high school two blocks from where Motown used to be, so that people were always going down to audition for Motown. We were always listening to the music. We were always the first people to get whatever it was they were doing. 
Um, at my house, my mother was not enamored of Motown. My mother was a big Leontine Price fan. So that we would be downstairs playing handball against the house, trying to listen to Motown, and my mother would be blasting Madame Butterfly <laughs> from upstairs. Um, we lived in a two-family flat in Detroit. Um, we were upstairs. Downstairs from us lived a man named Beans Bowles, who was a wonderful saxophone player who actually was a Motown mm -hmm. player with the Funk Brothers and all of that. So that sometimes they would be playing mm -hmm. downstairs. So my mother's playing Puccini upstairs. Beans Bowles and the guys are playing jazz or, or whatever they were going to have to do at Motown later in the day downstairs. So that music was everywhere around me and different kinds mm -hmm. of music. So that I think my mother, um, because she was a black nationalist, she was playing Leontine Price. So it allowed her to indulge her absolute passion for Puccini because it was a black mm -hmm. person singing it. So that she could sneak around mm -hmm. the only black, only black, only black, because it's like, well, we got to support Leontine Price. Mm -hmm. So it's like, mm -hmm. good, anything Leontine Price sang, we could play it, so that was fine. But I think that the, the idea of music being a part of what, what I hear when I hear the scene mm -hmm. in my head, when I see um, the people moving around in these books, I always see, um, I always hear music for them wow. because there's music, tends mm -hmm. to be music in my environment so that it, it comes through into what these people listen to. So that's an important part for you of kind of nurturing your own creative process. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of um, creative people, artists and scientists, um, will reference um, things that went wrong, you know, uh, sort of a s spectacular failure. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I was thinking this was going to happen and I tried really hard for this to happen and it was produced and it didn't go well, but that led me to something else or, or words to that effect. And I wonder if you've had any of those kind of disappointments, failures that both were hard to experience but also may have led you in a, in a new and different direction. Um. I've been, I need wood to knock on when mm -hmm. I say this, um, because I've been very fortunate. I haven't had like a big thing that went wrong, you know, where that you think fortunate. the audience <laughs> is going to love it and they just don't love right. it. Um, most of the things that go wrong for me, I handle in my own house mm -hmm. so that people don't see them go wrong. <laughs> my family gets to see what happens mm -hmm. when something goes wrong. Um, and the biggest thing I think was that, that first novel, trying to, to be so... Um, tied to what I thought a serious novelist mm -hmm. should be. Because I had written about 200 pages when I found myself vacuuming. So I had to mm -hmm. say to myself, this is not working. You need to start again. Now, throwing away 200 pages mm -hmm. is guaranteed to ruin the week at my house. Yeah. <laughs> it was awful, but nobody saw that mm -hmm. but my husband and my daughter, who have been sworn to secrecy. They can't <laughs> tell you how awful I acted because I, you know, I had spent a lot Absolutely. of time and effort on this. Yeah. So that, that that kind of thing I've had, but in terms of, of something where mm -hmm. I really had placed a lot of, of hopes for the future, um, I've been very fortunate. I haven't, I haven't had that. I have had actually the opposite experience where I have tried things that I thought were risky um, and people have embraced them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that part of that is what you were talking about before. I write in a very personal voice. Right. So I think people kind of look past whatever the form is I'm writing in because they're looking for my voice. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's a play that's kind of an avant-garde play or if it's a setting where it's performance art and we're going to be pouring water in a pan or whatever we were doing. Um, I think that if, as long as I'm talking, um, directly to people. I think that they find something genuine in my voice as a writer mm -hmm. that they will, will go through whatever the, the other things I'm doing to get to that. So that I always try to, to be sure that that's what I'm doing, drawing on what I know, mm -hmm. what I think, and how I would say it. Um, and I, once I got rid of, of Tony and Alice on my shoulders and sent them to kind of sit off to the side, um, I got over trying to write um, and please anyone else, um, either people who were there, people who were not mm -hmm. there. Um, one of the problems that I've seen in, in friends of mine who are writers is they'll write a wonderful book or a wonderful play, and then they try to write that same thing right. 12 times because it went well. And I always try to say to them, the audience didn't know that that's what you had written when they got there. They liked what you did, what came from you. So don't try to guess and say, next time I'm going to guess what they want and I'm going to do that. Because they didn't know what they wanted when they mm -hmm. came there. They wanted you. So give them you. Do what mm -hmm. you do. 
and then they will find something in there that's that's genuine because it's a it's heartbreaking to see somebody who can write and you see them trying to repeat that book and repeat mm -hmm. that book and publishers often will push people sure. in that direction right. yeah. um, because of the commercial mm -hmm. considerations and, and producers same thing so that it's it's really necessary to be able to say to yourself that's not what I'm interested in I don't want to write that I want to write to answer the questions that I have for myself mm -hmm. and I have to assume and I do assume now since I've been doing it for such a, a long time that if there are questions that are driving me crazy they're probably driving you crazy too so that if I can find a way to state them mm -hmm. in a way that you can see that that's your question too, then we're able to go that road together. And so do you draw your material then from your, your daily life? Your, um, as, are you inspired by something that you read about in the newspaper or one of the figures that you run into in Publix or? All of that, it, all, all of all, that. Yeah. I think the, the most important thing for me as a writer is to keep open to whatever is happening at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be, you know, when people tell me they're bored, I never get bored. Right. I don't even, I don't understand that. I don't know what that is. But that's because I can always make up a story. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm standing in line at the post office and I'm looking at the woman who's in front of me, who's got a big package and I know it's not wrapped correctly and all that. <laughs> and instead of saying, oh, I'm gonna be in here for 20 minutes, I say, I wonder what's in there. I wonder why this old woman is holding this great big package. She must be sending something to her grandchildren. Only grandchildren can make you do that. Okay, what is it that she's sending in this package? How long did it take her to wrap it? Does she know that she's gonna have to, all of that. So that I never have the problem of, oh, I've got 20 minutes to wait because I'm looking at the people mm -hmm. and trying to determine who they are, which is great for me then as a writer because it's like playing scales. If you're always thinking about people, it's like a musician playing scales. Then when you get ready to write your music, you've got all that to pull on. Mm -hmm. I've got people that cannot make it into the work I do just because there's so many of them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, um, near my house, about three blocks from my house, there's some group, and I don't know who they are, but they do some kind of sacrifices of chickens. So that every now and then, at a, at a crossroads in my neighborhood, there'll be a headless chicken. Now, my daughter thinks that's the most gross, disgusting thing she's ever seen. I'm fascinated with who killed the chicken, mm -hmm. what time do they put him out there after they kill him, what happened to the head? What is going to happen to the rest of it? So that I'm always going that way to see what's happening with the chicken. My daughter's always trying to avoid that way because she doesn't want to see it. But she's not a writer. So she doesn't have that, I'm going to use this later. Sometime this is going to be important to me. But I always feel like every single encounter, every single exchange is teaching me something else about about humans, because we do such interesting things. You know, even just wrapping a package for our grandbabies, it's like, what is it that we do? Um, so that I'm, I'm taking from everything. So there's a, there's a mystery, in a way, about all of these human interactions mm -hmm. and, um, and behaviors, and that, that's the mystery you're pursuing. You want to see where it takes you. Well, speaking of Alice Walker, you've mentioned her several times, and in a way, sort of literally, she's still on your shoulders because we have her materials collected here at Emory, and, um, and so we consider her to be one of us. <laughs> and um, I noticed that on your um, website, you reference um, several people, um, including Langston Hughes and others whose work has really influenced you, such as Alice Walker and Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about the ways that, um, in the case of Alice Walker, even though you're not Alice Walker, the way that her work has influenced you. And also a little bit about the kind of spiritual dimension that mm -hmm. she has in her work, as well as Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, Alice is right up there with Langston Hughes to me, and, and I think he's just like a little bit ahead because I heard him as a little baby girl. Um, but Alice Walker is, um, I've gotten to know her since she was intimidating me sitting on my shoulders, and she's not that way yeah, at all. Yeah. You know, she's a wonderful, warm uh, person. But I think she's so brave in her work as a writer because she has written so many things that people were angry about. Don't write about that. Don't talk about that. Don't air laundry in, in public, dirty laundry in public, all of that. And Alice is so not influenced by that at all. I think the whole idea of someone feeling like they could tell her what to write or what not to write, she can't even imagine reacting to such a thing. So I admire her bravery. Um, as someone who grew up in the kind of black nationalist community-based household that I grew up in, I was always concerned about how are the people 
going to react to this because we're trying to build a revolution here. So how are the people going to react mm -hmm. to this or that? And some of the things that Alice writes about um, drew me up sharp because they were things that we were not supposed to be talking mm -hmm. about. Certainly the color purple, um, right. in the same way that for colored girls and the women of Brewster Place raised the issue of domestic violence mm -hmm. in a way that started a dialogue in the African American community that hadn't been um, present in that way before, and that started off very angry with many black men saying, we shouldn't be talking about this, we should be talking about, about race, we shouldn't be talking about gender. And I had many interesting discussions with my dad about that, that gender is not the issue, we can't talk about mm -hmm. this. So Alice, I think, was the writer who gave me permission as a just discovering my feminism to talk about women's issues. And I don't even like the phrase women's issues anymore. Um, but at that time, the issues that women were more likely to be talking about than men. Mm -hmm. So that I, I am always grateful to her for giving me a space to talk about um, those things. Um, I also remember, um, after I had been reading her for a while, reading The Temple of My Familiar, right. which is probably my favorite Alice Walker book because it is so big. It is so not tied to this little house on this little street. Um, and that was really wonderful for me, just in terms of saying, you know, you can really make it bigger. You don't have to have a canvas that's this big. Mm -hmm. You can be an African-American woman fully grounded in and rooted in and reflective of who you are as an African-American woman and still embrace you know, history and the world and past lives and all those things that are in that book. So she is always the one that I feel pushes me in the best possible way to not get satisfied, to say, okay, that was good, now what you gonna do next? You know, she what else also have you works got? in a wide range of genres as she well. She does, she does, and it's her voice. I don't care what she's mm -hmm. writing about. Her new book is about her flock of chickens, right. um, The Chicken Chronicles, and I don't know if you all have read it, but it's, you know, a lot of my friends are just, you know, distraught because Alice is writing about these chickens. And I said, you need to read the book. She's not really writing about chickens. <laughs> She's writing about being in the moment. If you can look at this chicken foot and see this foot, then you can see humans, you can see the earth, you can see everything. So I'd love her for that, for the, for the push. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh I love because People often will think when they see me in public settings like this, and my daughter is known to cackle hysterically whenever anyone says this, that I'm a very calm, grounded person and that I'm always, you know, fully conscious of what I'm doing and, you know, all of that, which is one part of me, but the other part of me is an absolute mad woman. Mm -hmm. I'm angry about things. I'm mad at what's going on in Washington. I'm distraught about executions of human beings. Mm -hmm. I'm all of those things so that Thich Nhat Hanh, um, who is a, a meditation master and a poet and a teacher and an anti-war activist and just an amazing human being, I decided I was going to meditate because I wanted to not be quite as mad a woman as I was. And so I didn't know who to pick. So I got all of these things um, from, the, uh, from the bookstore that had this stuff. And his was the first one. I picked up, and it actually was a tape of someone else reading his words um, from the miracle of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And it was so wonderful and so clear and so um, easy to follow that it just made me love him. I had never heard of him. And so I went to the bookstore and asked the people, do you have anything else by this author? And the person thought I was trying to be funny. They <laughs> laughed at me. And I said, no, I'm serious. So they went and showed me there's like three bookshelves of nothing but Thich Nhat Hanh, and I had never heard mm -hmm. of him. So that I've read a number of his books, um, and they're all um, as wonderful as that first one, and actually started me um, on a path to being able to meditate without feeling like I had to go off into the mountains and sit in a strange way and only breathe out of one nostril at a time. And, you know, all of those things that are for people way more advanced than I am. Um, but he actually allowed me to understand what meditation can do. And for a writer, for me as a writer, it's a wonderful thing because it, it quiets your mm -hmm. mind. And there's always that question when you sit down, how am I going to pick from all these people that right. are talking in there? Um, how am I going to pick which three I'm going to listen to? And meditation helps that a lot. It also helps, you know, to keep me from throwing things at my television when I watch the news, all of that. Um, because it does give you a chance to, to focus in on the quiet that is in you, as opposed to the part of you that's, that's hollering and screaming and arguing and doing all those unattractive things. So, so we've talked a little bit about the role of emotion in art, both shaping art and in responding to it. And is there a, an emotional state that you think it sort of defines um, your work or has brought you out or was earlier, uh, more important in an earlier stage, like 
you know, could be love, could be rage, or, or anything in between. Do you think that there, that Emotion, in fact, is a motivating force for you. Oh, I think emotion is a total motivating force for me, and I think it's probably love and rage and everything in between. Um, of course, now that I am older, I'm thinking and writing more about being older. Right. Um, just, you know, when I was 25, I was thinking and writing a lot about being 25. Um, but I think that um, certainly the, the emotional reaction to something is where it usually starts for me. Um, Many times I will start off angry about something, but then as the book evolves or the play evolves, there's always a love story in the middle mm -hmm. of it because I'm not mad all the time. You know, I'm mad when I, you know, am looking at, at big events. Within my household, I'm, I'm usually pretty happy and peaceful so that there's almost always in my books all of the stuff that's going on that has to be changed in that community. Um, and there's also a wonderful love affair where the person has found someone they've been searching for over lifetimes and all of that. Um, because I think that, that the, the rage is built on wanting to create mm -hmm. a place where there is peace and quiet and safety so that people can fall in love and have children and raise children and grow old together without all of the war and, and madness that is around us. So I think that my, my anger is always coming from why can't we have a more peaceful world? Why can't we figure out how to do these things in a way that allows everybody to eat, everybody to sleep indoors, everybody to have health care, yeah. all of that? Why can't we do that? Um, it's and kind then of idealism. To also, and to also show, if we could, what would that look like? You know, I started writing about West End, which is the, um, I live in Southwest Atlanta, and I set um, six of my books in West End, and I imagined a West End that was peaceful, where there was no violence against women, where there was no problem for children, where people could actually walk around at four mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning and not be concerned about it. Um, and I wanted to do it because I want us to remember what a community could look like if we could make it what we want it to be. I would love to be able to walk in the park that's a block from my house and not be looking over my shoulder because there's predators in that park. I would love to be able to sit on my front porch and not hear gunshots because there's predators mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. I would love to be able to leave a potted plant outside and figure it's gonna be there in the morning and not have to worry about whether or not someone took it to sell it for crack. So that all of those things are together in my mind and being able to write a book where all of those things did not happen was important for me to remember what it is I'm struggling for. So I always try to put that in the book along with the reason we want that is so we can fall madly in love and you know, <laughs> have a good life. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> uh, um, you, you're not actively in a teaching role right now in your life, but you have been in the past. You've taught at Spelman and other places. and. So that's been, and education's been an important part of your life. So how, how do you teach these creative um, moments or drives or even the writing process to your students? You know, how do you instill that in them as well? The, the first thing I always try to ask my writing students is to find out what they are passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget, I was teaching at Spelman, and the first day I gave my speech about to find out what you're passionate about, and this will be where your work will come from, and all of that. And a young woman waited for me and came up to me after class and said, I loved what you said. What am I passionate about? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I met you an hour ago. I have no idea. <laughs> she had never thought about being passionate about anything. Mm -hmm. So she was delighted at the idea that she could be 18 years old and be passionate about something. So we had a ball that whole semester, you know, just trying to figure out what she was passionate about, what she cared about, all of that. So I try to get them to start there with right. something that they care about. And then I try to explain to them that what they're looking for many times is some kind of magical something that can allow you to write without having to work really, mm, really hard. Yeah, that would be and great. there is no secret <laughs> like that. I mean, if you know it, I implore you to tell me what it is <laughs> because I don't think there is a secret. I think that it's hard work. You have to do it. You have to get up, think about it, go to your desk, write things down. I think you have to work in the same way that you would work at anything else. Um, my friend Tony Cade Bambaro, who is a wonderful author who has passed away now, said that she didn't like to call herself an artist because then it made you start acting precious, like you were so above everybody else, that she thought that we should call ourselves cultural workers because we were no better than people who worked in factories, no better than people who taught school, no better than people who were nurses and doctors and all of that. We were cultural workers. And I thought that was wonderful because that actually is part of what you have to do is to resign yourself to, if you don't automatically like it, 
um, the fact of the hard work that is required to do creative work. So that I think my students are sometimes disappointed, especially now because they'll look at, they'll Google me and say, she must know the secret, you know, <laughs> she's got it, let me go find the secret. And my secret is so boring, which is get up every day, drink your coffee and write for six hours. That's not what they're looking right, for. Right. So that it's, it's usually a process of trying to get them to understand that if they will do that, at the end of a month, they'll have 50 pages. At the end of two months, they'll have 100 pages. So that it, it's, um, it's a kind of a combination of trying to get them to focus on their passion and also to understand that craft and discipline are absolutely necessary if you really want to do it right. We thought you were going to give us a secret today. I know, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I keep looking for it. <laughs> if, if you hadn't um, been a writer, do you know what you might have been? Were there, other, were there other areas where you thought you could have expressed your passion? Or? Well, I actually used to want to be a dancer. I danced uh -huh. all the way through high school and college, modern dance. Uh -huh. I was a big Martha Graham fan. I was totally anti-ballet because it was, you know, all the things that ballet is that I did not like. I loved modern dance. Uh -huh. Um, but I also realized very early that in order to do that well, you really have to commit to it in the same way that you do writing. Um, the other thing was I never wanted to be a choreographer. I wanted to be a dancer. I liked the, the process of dancing. I loved the movement of dance. I didn't want to be a choreographer. And I realized how powerless dancers are. It's like actors. You can be really wonderful at it, but you're always at the mercy of the person who wrote the script, the person who's directing it. Um, so that I knew that that was, um, was going to be a problem for me as a dancer, as an opinionated dancer. And I also had the very practical idea that I felt like I could write until I was a little old lady who couldn't pick up the pen anymore. Mm -hmm. And I know that dancers have a very limited life because their knees go and their ankles go and, and all of that. And I wanted to be able to invest in an art form that I could do until I die. Mm -hmm. And I thought writing was, was going to give me the most control over what I did, the most ability to grow myself rather than having to find a choreographer who had my same vision. But to be able to, to look at myself, know myself, and try to see if I could push myself to get better without having to have anybody there at all. Now, it's wonderful to also have people who want to publish. It's wonderful to have producers who want to do the plays. But if none of the work I had ever done had been performed or published anywhere, I would still be writing. Right. I'd have to find another way to make a living, of course. But the, the writing itself is how I process the world. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever I finish something big, I always say I'm not going to write anything for six months. I'm not mm -hmm. writing anything. Don't ask me about it. And that lasts for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I can't do it. I can't understand the world unless I write it down. Mm -hmm. So even when I'm not working on something, I'm an obsessive journal keeper. I write journals because I need to be able to put the words on paper to understand what's going on around me. So that, you know, people laugh at me now when I give my six month edict, I'm not doing it, don't ask me. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> then they come two back weeks. in two weeks. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, I gotta write something. So how about the work that you're working on now? What are you, what are you looking towards or what are you hoping for? How, what, what, what might it become? Um, well, I'm actually working on a play. I'm working um, on a play that will be at part of the next season at the Alliance um, called What I Learned in Paris. Mm. And it opens um, on the night that Maynard Jackson was first elected mayor um, in Atlanta in 1973. And when I first thought about this as a time period, I wanted to explore um, looking back at it, and I was here at that time, worked in that campaign. I was thinking almost exclusively about black politics at that time and what that was about. And then as I started looking at 1973, I realized how many other things that were important to my life were going on. The Vietnam War was winding down. Karis Books had just opened over there in Little Five Points so that my feminist awakening was happening. So that all of those things that when I first looked back, all I thought about was black male political progress. Um, it made me understand that that was a very rich period for me as a, as a young woman, for the city, for the country. And I wanted to make sure that the play didn't get stuck in just the thing that we mm -hmm. tend to focus on, which is this was when the black mayor got elected. It's like, yeah, it was. But it was also the moment where all of us who worked to get the black mayor elected went home to tell the black men who were working on these campaigns how they were going to have to behave differently in the House. You know, how just because they had elected a black mayor didn't mean they weren't going to have to share child um, rearing responsibilities or um, any of the other tasks that happen in the house. So that the play is really trying to look at all of those mm -hmm. different energies that were coming through, which is really fun for me. I always like to be able to discover 
um, something that I hadn't been looking for right. um, when I start working. So 1973 is such a, a, a rich year to look at here, and the play has become um, a much different idea than I started out with, which is always fun. Part of the process of discovery. Mm -hmm. and. And the title, What I Learned in Paris? What how, I Learned in Paris. How does that connect to these events? Um, one of the characters, well, there's actually one who doesn't want any involvement in things, um, so she goes to Paris um, whenever she feels herself. She works in political mm -hmm. campaigns. Whenever she feels herself being drawn to stay and work for the candidate mm -hmm. after the election or drawn to some man she's met in the campaign that she thinks she's madly in love with, she goes to Paris ah. for two weeks by herself so that she can say to herself, look at what a wonderful time I'm having. If I had taken that guy with me, what would I be doing? I'd be worrying about whether or not he was having a good time. So I don't want that. I want to always be doing what I'm doing. So she goes to Paris. And they have to talk about what she's learned in Paris um, with another woman who has also been, who says, only thing I learned in Paris was how to eat by myself in a big, expensive restaurant. <laughs> I know how to go there. I don't have to take a book. I don't have to take a newspaper. I can go by myself to a big restaurant in Paris, order a meal, and enjoy it all by myself. So that one, right. you know, who was, the other one was trying so hard to get free, and the one who was ordering the meal said, it's really easy, just get yourself a good meal, you'll be fine. Well, speaking of Paris, I was interested in that title because we have an exhibition going on right outside the store in the library that's related to literary works in Paris. Is mm -hmm. that right? We have some of the librarians mm -hmm. here, so um, the, you know, that might help inspire those Paris thoughts as mm -hmm. well. Um, your work has, you know, I think all of us are really grateful for the fact that the, the, the writing impulse took over your life and that it's something that can sustain you mm -hmm. for the rest of your life because it sustained all of us as well. Okay. And we've had such um, great pleasure in getting to know you um, through your work and also now through you in your presence with us. And last night we had a brief exchange that you might be willing to read a, a poem or a piece where did you- The piece I read last night? Yeah, sure. if you have that. Sure, sure. Um, that would be great. Just it was. Um, we've talked a lot about kind of the role and place of history in your life and and the past, I guess, personal mm -hmm. history as well. And I thought that poem was a good expression okay. of that. But this is I read the, the just the thing I read last night. Sure. Okay. Want to be sure I got my cue correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a uh, this is a, a suite of things, but I'll just read uh, two short ones um, about Motown. Uh, first one is called Blue Lights in the Basement. Flashback, flashback, flashback. In high school, we used to say, ain't nothing but a party, which meant nothing short of paradise. Stacks of the latest 45s clicking into place on the record player, a blue light for atmosphere screwed into the socket over the wash tubs, and when the slow records came on, no lights at all. Or a lock on the basement pantry door for those who had moved beyond the simple pleasures of grinding one fully clothed pelvis against another. Nothing but a party, and we would dance and drink wine and hope the thugs did not arrive, but when they did, and they always did. Umbrellas that had nothing to do with rain tapping in front as if they were blind men. Stingy brim hats cocked in defiance of gravity or greasy do-rags wound, rewound, and tied in front low over the eyes. When they did arrive, we would walk trance-like into their arms, letting them fold their hot black leather coats around us, licking and whispering in our ears, laughing and growling down deep in their throats, moaning us into dim corners until we, choking on our own delighted giggles, leaned back to look into their eyes, disapproving and prissy pressing our teasing virgin breasts into their forbidden Ban Lan chests and wondering what possible sweetness life had to offer that could be finer than this. <laughs> flashback, flashback, flashback. The Ritual Record. It had to be 1959, 1960. I was still a little girl. I don't remember having breasts yet, but I might have. After a while, that kind of thing seems like something that's always been there. But me and Chris were coming from the beauty shop, so I know it was Saturday because we only got our hair done on Saturday, once a month. In between times, we touched up the edges with a hot comb that my mother didn't know how to use very well because her hair didn't need straightening, although ours coming to us by way of our father was still a good 10 years away from coming into style. So we learned to do it ourselves. Well, I learned to do it. My sister pulled hers back into a big clump, pierced her ears, and became a beatnik, but that's not this story. <laughs> this story is about the record, the ritual record, the first 45 record that you buy with your very own money. 
That first trip to the record store with your 50 cents clutched in your little hot hand, scared to walk by all the conked boys hanging around outside the front door, but determined to have the record. And knowing they didn't carry it at Grinnell's downtown, which is where my mother went to buy her Puccini, and where you could go into a row of little glass booths and listen to the record before you decided whether or not you wanted to buy it. No, Grinnell's didn't know anything about the music I was looking for. I was looking for the music that was all black and mostly under 25. I was looking for the music that made you know something good was coming to you in the next couple of years. And even though you weren't sure what exactly it was going to feel like, you hoped it felt like the Marvelettes and the Supremes and Martha and the Vandellas and Mary, I Got Two Lovers and I Ain't Ashamed Well. You hoped it felt like the Four Tops and Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye and the Contours and Junior, I Don't Need No Teeth to Play My Saxophone Walker. I was looking for Motown. Mayo Motown. That first time, I didn't want Miss Girl singing about baby love. I wanted the one she was talking to. I wanted to hear the response that was coming from the object of her affections, the ones who made Brenda Holloway feel so bad, the ones who made Tammy Terrell and Kim Weston sound so happy and excited when they were happy and excited. I was looking for Paul Williams and David Ruffin and the rest of the perfectly processed young men who had just released a song called Dream Come True. I wanted the temptations, and I knew where to find them. Up on 12th Street or Linwood or Dexter over near the Avalon Theater, all the places my mother was getting increasingly nervous about us going to by ourselves since my sister already had breasts, I do remember that. And she was taller and walked with a long-legged stride that made the guys in front of the record store smile at her and say, hey, little red as she loped on by. I didn't care. The danger seemed a small price to pay for the pleasures of dream come true. Because when they said that stuff about, I don't care where you came from, I don't care where you have been. All I know is that I love you, and I'm going to love you till the end. I wanted to believe it, no. I was only 10, maybe 11. I did believe it. Even I was young once and in love. Mm -hmm. Flashback. Blast, Blast. I think the poetry says it all. There's not much <laughs> more we can say beyond that, but um, except for a word of thanks to all the people who are here, to the organizers of this um, great series of events here, and especially to you for being a part of today of our community. Thank We're you very so grateful much. for thank your you. presence. And thank, thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>